Hello and welcome to GameSack. The 32-bit generation was the first to go 3D and let's face it, it didn't always happen gracefully. So I figured I'd put together this episode showing every single Saturn game that runs at 60 frames per second. And why not, the Nintendo 64 too. With a few caveats, of course. Number one, no 2D games because it's just a given that 2D games are gonna run at 60 frames per second. So these games need to have polygon graphics somewhere in their actual gameplay to be included here. Number two, no hidden or unlockable high frame rate modes. The main game needs to be at 60 frames per second. Number three, they need to maintain that frame rate for most of the time. No variable frame rates where it may reach 60 frames per second for like a second or two sometimes. I'm looking at you, Gauntlet Legends. Anyway, let's start with the Nintendo 64. First up is Dark Rift from Vic Tokai. This is a one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting game. By the way, you're gonna be seeing a lot of these in this episode. This game is generally nothing special, with the exception of its frame rate, which for the Nintendo 64 is very special indeed. You fight in stages that are mostly dark and somewhat blurry with not really a ton of detail. But hey, at least you can react quickly thanks to the high frame rate that this game offers. If you didn't know, the higher your frame rate, the less lag your controls will have. I'm actually kind of surprised that Vic Tokai went the extra mile with this one as 99% of the console's library just didn't bother. Battle commence. <laughs> Yeah, you knew F-Zero X from Nintendo would be mentioned. This follow-up to the Super Nintendo game took great lengths to make sure it maintained the 60 frames per second speed, and I'm glad they put in the effort. Yeah, there's not a ton of detail here, but the result is still worth it. The gameplay is fast, and the high frame rate really helps you react not only to the other racers, but to the crazy tracks themselves. Yeah, some of these courses are insane. There are also 29 other racers on the track at the same time. Not only all that, but the music is outstanding. It's all even better if you get the expansion kit for the 64DD as you'll get stereo music and definitely the best F-Zero X experience. This is as good as it gets on the Nintendo 64, at least on a technical level. And it's certainly up there towards the top on a gameplay level as well. I've said it before, but this is an absolute must have for the console. Next is Killer Instinct Gold from Rare. This one-on-one -on -one fighter uses digitized 2D sprites for the characters, but the backgrounds are all constructed with 3D polygons. This was basically Nintendo and Rare's answer to Mortal Kombat, and you can see it everywhere in this game. Using the unprecedented power of the Nintendo 64 console, these stages are able to move at an astonishing 60 frames per second. The movement of the camera looks good, but naturally the movement of the characters themselves is pretty choppy. Oh well, the frame rate of the digitized characters isn't exactly why we're here today. But the good news is, is that the presentation is nice in this one all around. Speaking of Mortal Kombat, here's Mortal Kombat 4 from Midway. This is the first game in the series that used polygonal characters instead of digitized sprites. Man, all of those actors out of work, replaced by technology. Everything here moves very fast, and as a result it ends up being much more impressive technically than Killer Instinct Gold. The controls are extremely responsive. The characters react immediately to your input. The stages move around quickly, though they are pretty simple in their design. In fact, most of the stages take place in a medium-sized room with a few walls and not much other geometry. Still, it all looks pretty good. Everything here is 60 frames per second, even the tower. And even the continue screen where you fall to your death unless you continue in time. 
Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Mortal Kombat games, but I've got to admit that I had fun with this one. Fight. <laughs> Finally, we have Super Smash Brothers from HAL. This weird fighting game only kind of counts. If you're in the one player mode and fighting only one other Smash Brother, then it pretty much runs at 60 frames per second without dropping many frames. However, in some stages like this, where you need to face a bunch of different colored Smash Brothers over and over for what seems like an eternity, the frame rate can drop when there are too many of the family on screen at once. But the good news is that it doesn't drop that many frames at all. In fact, in my playtime here, it only dropped to about the high 40s at the very lowest, so that's not bad. I'm assuming that in multiplayer, the same thing will happen, so this game barely even counts. But I figured I might as well include it. And that's it. That's all the system has to offer in this regard. The Nintendo 64 does what it can. Now onto the Saturn, which was less powerful than the Nintendo 64, but had many more games that ran at 60 frames per second. It all boils down to how the memory is used and what types of memory they have in each console. I'm not really an expert, but I think eventually there's gonna be some comments down in the comment section, which is where comments usually go, that explain it a lot better than I can. Oh, and I didn't mention that before, but you might wanna make sure you're watching this video at 60 frames per second. I mean, that goes without saying, but if things don't look very smooth, you might want to check your playback settings. Anyway, on with the Saturn games. We start with All Japan Pro Wrestling featuring Virtua from Sega. This is a wrestling game that uses real Japanese wrestlers and a couple of characters from the Virtua Fighter franchise. Since it's a wrestling game, I suck at it and I don't enjoy it at all, but for its time it looks really good. The game runs in high resolution and the frame rate doesn't slow down much, if at all. You have a constant announcer, which I suppose is impressive, but it makes the game feel slow. Granted, the game is slow. I just personally rather have music. It was also never released outside of Japan. Next is Bases Loaded 96 from Jalico. Way back in the day when I rented this awful game, I never thought I'd have a reason to ever play it again. Well, here we are, look how smooth it is. The frame rate is pretty much the only thing that this turd does well. Here's Clockwork Knight from Sega. This is a game about toys that have come to life. No, it wasn't inspired by the movie Toy Story as it came out nearly a year before the movie did, but it did inspire the look of the Toy Story game on the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, true story. Anyway, most of the background is made out of polygons and they move with excellent fluidity, just like you'd expect from any platforming game that came before it. The high frame rate makes it super easy to follow the boxes in the bonus round as they move around so you can get the prize that you want. You can't do that as well with a lower frame rate. Overall, this is a decent to good game. Clockwork Night 2 also makes this list. This is more of the same as to be expected, but a bit more refined. There are new types of stages for you to work your way through. Neither of these games have ever really been among my favorites, but they're not bad and certainly worth trying out to see if they earn a place among your favorites. Here's Contra Legacy of War from Konami. 
Actually, Konami couldn't be bothered with something silly like Contra, so they farmed it out to Appaloosa. They did not do a good job, except with the frame rate, which is pretty solid. There is some slowdown here and there, though. Despite the extremely crisp motion, I don't really recommend this one. It's Contra in name only. Up next is Dead or Alive from Tecmo. This one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting game is a home conversion of the Model 2 arcade game. You'll be seeing a few of these in this episode. Just outside of the ring are little explodey things that'll hurt you if you fall on them. The Saturn version here runs in the console's highest resolution mode of 704 by 480 and still maintains the 60 frames per second at all times. For a weaker console, it kinda does put what the Nintendo 64 can do to shame, and there's really no way you can deny that. Anyway, compared to the arcade, this one lost some of the background detail but gained some excellent arranged music. Here's Decathlete from Sega. This is an excellent arcade style game full of mini games based on Olympic events. This is a really fun one to play with friends, even if you take turns. You always wanna beat the world record and definitely beat your friends records, which honestly is way more important. Each event begins with instructions, though you can skip them or even disable them entirely in the options. The entire game runs in high resolution and 60 frames per second, which makes it look super crisp and clean, especially for the time. You just can't go wrong with this one. This is called Digital Dance Mix Volume 1, Nami Amuro, from Sega, and it was only released in Japan. This is kind of a game, I guess. You can watch Nami dance, and she's rendered pretty well for the Saturn. There are two songs, as well as different versions of each song you can watch her dance to. Pretty exciting stuff, I tell you. There are also mini games to play, even one which is kind of a rhythm game, except that it sucks. It all moves at 60 frames per second, though. The Saturn sure has a bunch of these smooth fighting games, so here's a few more. Next is Fighting Vipers from Sega. This is a 3D fighting game based on rules similar to Virtua Fighter, except that the fighters here wear armor that can be broken and each match is a cage match. The game runs in interlaced mode and naturally at 60 frames per second as well, or fields per second if we're getting technical, but we still get 60 different moments in time per second here, or 59.94 different moments in time if we're being technical. It really doesn't matter in this episode if we use the fields or frames nomenclature. It'll only bother those who are extremely pedantic like myself. And here's Fighter's Mega Mix. This game combines characters from both Virtua Fighter and Fighting Vipers, and you can play by either game's rules. Like all of Sega's fighting games that run at 60 frames per second, it also runs in interlaced mode. You'll encounter some slowdown here and there, but Fighting Vipers also had some slowdown. It's still fun though, especially when you start unlocking some of the more ridiculous characters you can play as. I highly recommend it. Yeah, so here's Final Fight Revenge from Capcom. This was the last game released for the console and it was only available in Japan. It also requires the four megabyte RAM cartridge. 
Capcom thought that we needed a one-on-one -on -one fighting game based on Final Fight. It didn't work out well, and honestly, it's kind of odd. The characters look really chunky. But hey, the movement is super smooth, which is why it gets a mention here in this episode today. However, I do not recommend that you seek this one out. Here's Goiken Muyo, Anarchy and the Nippon. This 3D fighting game is a Virtua Fighter 2 clone. Well, it actually does have one thing that really makes it stand out. You can't jump. At all. At least I can. It's just absolute anarchy! This game goes for a more humorous approach as well with its characters. Like so many of these games, it runs in interlaced mode and it's actually in high resolution. Hi. <laughs> Here's Guardian Heroes from Treasure. This is a rather chaotic beat-em-up that desperately wants to be Fatal Fury. Does this one count? I'm not sure if this one counts. The polygons in this one are basically just used for the ground, which is completely flat. At least I'm assuming they're polygons. This game also has quite a bit of slowdown. Yeah, I'm gonna say this one barely counts. This is J League Go! 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 From Tecmo. This is a soccer game where all of the players are made with polygons. Everything moves smoothly and the game itself is decent. You have some energetic music while you play to help you stay awake. What else can I tell you? It's a soccer game. Here's Jonah Lemu Rugby from Rage Software and Codemasters. This rugby game was only ever released in Europe where it runs at a pathetic, wimpy, and honestly quite embarrassing 50 frames per second. You know, I think I'd rather be dead than to have to play games at such an incredibly low frame rate. But find a way to play the game on a Japanese or North American console like I have here, and you get a blazing, amazing 60 frames per second. There's some slowdown here, but even when that happens, you don't get many dropped frames at all. I can't tell you how happy I am that my forefathers rejected the King of England and fought for our independence so that we could experience this game running at 10 more frames per second. Definitely worth it. I think George Washington would like this game. I can't see the ball in there. Monster of a pass. And again, they've stolen it. Up next is Last Bronx from Sega. This is another fighting game. However, this is a weapons-based one. As expected, it moves super fast and runs in interlaced mode. I like that some of the stages have a ceiling, and I actually feel it helps set this game apart from all of the other similar Sega fighting games, at least a little bit. It's kind of sad when all of your fighting games are so samey that a ceiling ends up being the standout feature. Oh well, other than that, this one's okay. Here's Mass Destruction from ASC Games and NMS Software. This is a game that has you driving a tank around and causing, well, mass destruction. You have various objectives that you need to complete in each stage, and it's pretty mindless beyond that. It's very enjoyable. And of course, as you can see, it's buttery smooth, almost to a fault. I love it. I even remember the game magazines back in the day talking about the 60 frames per second in this one. Amazingly, this version is much smoother than the PlayStation port, which only runs at half the frame rate. 
That one's still a good game, but it's so much better here, simply because of the smooth frame rate. Oh hell yeah, it's Radiant Silver Gun from Treasure. This vertical shooter is one of the best games on the Saturn, and it's such a shame that it was left in Japan in its own time. I suck at it, especially since I haven't played it in a while, and also since Treasure is always so quirky. But I always have fun with this one, even if I'm doing poorly. This shooter definitely requires some technique if you want to master it. The graphics and music are both just so perfect. Everything moves at a high frame rate, and that's likely because of the game's arcade roots. This is such an impressive game on all fronts, and naturally it's in this episode because it excels in the frame rate department as well. All right, let's finish this. Up next, another fighting game. At least I guess it is. It's kind of a weird one. It's Savaki by Sinus? Sinus? Sinus. This is a one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting game where you're trapped inside of a cage. It was never released outside of Japan. No, it's not the MMA, it's better. It's Savaki. Basically, each fighter has their own martial arts discipline, and you need to take down all the rest. Your opponents change, but sadly, the stage itself never does. The game is also very monochromatic. The only splash of color you ever get is this guy's red shorts. Still, the graphics are very impressive on a technical level. No polygons flicker in and out of existence, not even the cage. Hell, there's even a ceiling, so you know this game's good. The music is outstanding. As a game, it's okay, but it doesn't remain interesting for long. This is Shinrei Jusatsushi Taramaru from Time Warner Interactive. It's also sometimes called Psychic Killer Taramaru. This is one of the rarest games for the console with fewer than 10,000 released copies. As a result, it's extremely expensive on the collector's market and it always has been. These days, people are asking over $1,000 for it. You play as a dude who shoots magic from his little symbol that locks onto enemies, mostly automatically. It takes a bit to get used to, but once you do, it's a lot of fun. This game uses a lot of spooky, evil Japanese imagery and I love it. This 2D game uses lots of polygons for its backgrounds, and the action here is always smooth, never slowing down. It's really too bad that this game stayed in Japan, but it's certainly not surprising that it did. Next is Skeleton Warriors from Playmates. This is an action game based on the short-lived toy line. You're a pre-rendered dude on a slightly repetitive quest, if I'm being honest. The 2D stages have some polygons in them. The 3D bonus stages, however, are definitely not running at 60 frames per second. Overall, this is a decent game, but probably not among anyone's favorites, including mine. This is Street Racer Extra, even though it only says Street Racer. Putting the extra on the screen cost extra, I guess. Anyway, this is a kart racing game from Ubisoft and it was released everywhere except for North America. As you can see, the visuals are extremely smooth and crisp. 
The track visuals are a bit different from the PlayStation version, which did get a US release, but it's still every bit as smooth. Unfortunately, the tracks are incredibly short, so short that there are 10 laps in a single race and it still feels super short. It almost feels like it's not a real game, but hey, at least it's smooth and moderately entertaining. Here's Striker96 from Ubisoft and Rage Software. You might remember Rage from that rugby game. Yep, same people, and they made sure this soccer game moved as smoothly as it could, and it never drops any frames. However, it is extremely bare bones, and honestly, the smooth frame rate is one of the few things it has going for it. It supports up to six players simultaneously, though. Otherwise, it feels kind of empty. Here's Tempest 2000 from Interplay and High Voltage Software. This is a reimagining of the old game Tempest, but in the future. I guess this game counts for this episode. I mean, it seems to have 3D graphics and it's definitely moving at 60 frames per second. It also moves at a higher frame rate than the original Jaguar version because, let's face it, the Saturn is way better. Ah yes, it's Virtua Fighter 2 from Sega. This game was revolutionary at the time, at least on the Saturn. It was the first time we saw the console in its highest resolution at 60 frames per second like this. It gave Saturn owners hope that maybe, just maybe, the PlayStation wouldn't completely walk all over it in the graphics department. We were clinging to any little thing like this. The game itself isn't bad, but it's a bit bare bones with not a ton of fighters. I also suck at it, but it's one of those that I always have fun playing, even if I do suck at it. Hey, what more can I say? It's Virtua Fighter 2. And then there's Virtua Fighter Kids. For some idiotic reason, Sega felt the need to take Virtua Fighter 2 and give all of the characters big heads, because having a giant head means you're a kid. The tiny bodies actually ruin the gameplay since you have next to no reach. The graphics are nice and bright, but there's really not much else to say about this one other than it runs in the same high resolution and frame rate mode as Virtua Fighter 2 did. Here's Worldwide Soccer from Sega. Yeah, I know, it says Sega International Victory Goal, but they forgot to change the title screen when they localized it. They probably ran out of time because of the early US launch of the Saturn, and this was a launch game. Anyway, this game is super smooth and also pretty tough, just like all of Sega's soccer games on the system. You can change the camera zoom level on the fly. You know, like Virtua Racing. You can even play the game at a slightly different angle by adjusting it in the pause menu. This isn't a great game, but it does offer some outstanding music, way better than any sports game deserves. The sequels to this one look better, but with lower frame rates. Finally, we have Zero Divide from Zoom, which was only released in Japan. It's another one-on-one -on -one fighting game, but with robots or cyborgs or something. It's kind of like fighting vipers in that you knock each other's armor off and there are walls surrounding the fighting arena. This one's a bit more technically impressive though, as there seems to be more going on and the walls don't flicker in and out of existence. This is also another one that runs at a higher frame rate than the PlayStation version. 
Naturally, this one also runs in high resolution, which was the rule for 3D fighting games on Saturn after Virtua Fighter 2, with a couple of exceptions, of course. I'd say this one's worth trying. It's too bad it didn't come out over here. And there you go, every single Nintendo 64 and Sega Saturn game with 3D graphics that run at 60 frames per second. It is possible that I missed a few, especially on the Japanese side of the Sega Saturn, but I did my best. I think I got most, if not all of them. Yeah, I know the thumbnail says all, but hey, I've got to get those clicks somehow. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't take back your view, <laughs> sucker. Anyway, should I do the PlayStation? I mean, that thing has like, God like over 120 games that run at 60 frames per second, I think. Anyway, let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Hello friends, have you ever played 3D World Runner for the NES? Okay, I think that's too close. Hello friends, have you ever played 3D World Runner? No, that's definitely too far. Hello friends, have you ever played 3D World Runner? Jeez, how sensitive is this thing? Hello friends, have you ever played 3D World Runner? Christ. Hello friends, have you ever played Jeez? Hello friends, have you ever played Come On? Hello friends, have you... <sighs> Hello friends, have you ever played 3D World Runner? Because if you didn't know, this one has... Oh, come on, all I did was turn my head! Hello? Hello? Hello?